Well, good morning, Grace Fellowship Church. It is so good to be with you here on this Sunday morning. My name is Ryan. My name is Chris. And I'm just so happy to be a part of this worship service here with all of you. Whether you're in the room or online, we just want to say welcome. Welcome. We say a special welcome for those that are here for the very first time. We prepared a special gift just for you. For those that are in the room, go scan the QR code in the back seat in front of you. And those that are online, click it in the chat. Bam! They did it, that's the click sound. I'm so sorry, I wanted to make that noise so bad and I wanna cut you off. <laughs> Guys, um, we're so excited to be here with you. We're so excited also for our kids' ministry. It is booming and if you're here and you have kids or maybe you're online you have kids, you're like, ah, what do I to do with them during the service? We have a thriving kids' ministry. It's an awesome time, not only the safe and secure, but they're gonna have a blast. There's tons of music, there's mm. dancing, there's worship, there's some games involved. The kids have a great time, so I encourage you to check them out. If you're in the room right now, and you're like, man, I kinda wanna drop them off right now, you know? You can go over <laughs> right now to the hub. There's a giant sign that says Grace Kids. It's huge, you can't miss it. Go check it out. We hope you spend next weekend with us. We have some amazing things coming for Memorial Day weekend. Kelly Welsh, amazing, talented, is going to be bringing for a special me message. Don't forget. Ugh. You forgot. It's I forgot. don't forget Get to remember. remember. I you forgot. Got it. Oh. Did it. Join us. You do not want to miss that. Speaking of not missing things, maybe you're thinking, ah, oh, man, I want to flex some of my skills that I learned during the pandemic. Let me show you one of mine. I can spawn <laughs> guitar brooms out of thin air. That's right, and I can play it really well. And maybe you also picked up a wonderful instrument ability over the pandemic and you want to show off your skills. Maybe you can play the harpsichord, the nose flute. Maybe you're really good at guitar. We want to hear your skills. We would love to invite you to participate in our worship auditions here on June 5th. Oh, that's a Sunday Howdy. after the services. Check that out. Go to gfc.org slash worship. Athena, our wonderful worship director, will be in contact with you. We would love to see you there. It's time to worship. Those who can stay in, stay in. Let's do it. Let's go. Welcome, Grace. So glad you could be with us today. Uh, if you're able, to just stand and join us as we worship together. darkness falls, it won't breathe it. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. And I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the Boy. 
You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it
lost a battle, never lost a battle, never lost a battle, never lost a battle, never lost a battle. Fellowship Church, it is so good to cry out in one voice all together as brothers and sisters in Christ, a name that is above all names as the name of Jesus. If this is your very first time here at Grace, I just want to give you an extra warm welcome. Thanks for being here this morning. You could be anywhere doing a number of things, but you've chosen to spend part of your weekend here with us, and we're just so excited to be a small part of that with you. And we'd love to meet you, love to connect with you. You can do so if you're in the room by scanning the QR code on the seat back in front of you, or if you're online, click the link in the chat. We'd love to just connect. We'd love to just get to know who you are and help you get plugged into Grace Fellowship Church. We're going to continue our worship this morning through the giving of offering. I just want to highlight something that I've been in. The book of John chapter 4 says that the Father is coming, that the time is coming and is now here where the Father is seeking true worshipers to worship in spirit and in truth. And we are doing that right now. And this past week, we had an awesome leaders and volunteer meeting. And I was just so blessed to hear the vision that Pastor Shea and the rest of the leadership has here at Grace and what God is doing in this church right now and beyond these doors because we're not meant to be an aquarium. We're meant to be fishers of men and we want to go forth with the name of God. We want to go forth in the gospel and bring light to those that need it. So I want to thank you so much for your continued partnership and your generosity here at Grace. We have three ways that you can give here at Grace. The first is text to give and you can text give and the amount give one, give two, give one, two, three to the amount or to the number 410-324 6210 or if you're online or online family you can give at gfc.org slash give and if you're in person and after the service you feel moved to give you want to be part of what God is doing here at Grace you can give out in the hub at one of the giving stations out there can we just pray together for the offering dear Lord and Heavenly Father you are doing a mighty work in this place you have been going forth with us you are for us you are never against us and in you there is victory because you have never lost a battle i pray that we can just remember your promises that your scriptures are true lord that you have already won the battle we just have to go forth in faith knowing that you are for us lord i pray that as we give the offering this morning that it can go out to those that need it that i can go out to the widow to the poor to the orphan those who are marginalized those who people have forgotten about Lord, that we could use these offerings to really lift those out back into the light, that we can bring love, that we can bring peace, that we can bring hope in the name of your son, Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen. Amen. Well, um, the worship team has a new song today. It's going to be incredible. Um, It comes from one of the scriptures, John chapter 3. I've been on a John kick recently. It talks about how Christ needs to be increased in our lives and we need to decrease. God needs to be made more and we need to be made less. And as we magnify the name of Christ together with this next song, I'm just so excited to worship with all of you here. Let's sing together. Great intro to that song, Grace. 
And I ask, as we enter into this song, I know you don't know the words yet, but as you look at the words on the screen, just pray over it. And Christ be magnified.
your name be magnified. Because not us, you, Father. Let you be raised up. Just like Ryan said from John. Let you be raised up. Us will be brought down. Because we know when we rise you up, you lift us up from the ground. Father, we thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you. worship to you that we scream, Christ be magnified in me, and let my voice be raised up to those who don't know you, Father, so that when they meet me, they see you, Father. We thank you, Jesus. We praise you and let this day just be glorifying you and the rest of our week, Father, let us glorify your name. And the whole church says... Amen. Amen, Grace. I've missed you guys. It's been a minute. What an amazing time worshiping together. So before you're seated, I got a question for you. I know how to, I know Dan had a good one last week. Mine for you today is turn to someone near you and tell them truthfully, how many cups of coffee or tea have you had before you came to church today? All right, and as you are seated, please welcome Anoush John. Good morning. I was broken from a young age, taking my sulking to the masses, writing my poems for the few that look at me, took to me, shook at me, feeling me, singing my heartache from the pain, taking my message from the veins, speaking my lesson from the brain, seeing the beauty through the pain. I was choking in the crowd, building my rain up in the cloud, falling like ashes to the ground, hoping my feelings they would drown, but they never did, ever lived, ebbing and flowing, inhibited, limited, till it broke open and rained down like pain. That was from the song Believer by Imagine Dragons from their 2017 album, Evolve. <laughs> For lead singer Dan Reynolds, contrary to the usual experience, he says that pain made him a believer. This morning in a sermon entitled, Why? we are going to look at the issue of suffering. We've had four weeks already where we talked about suffering, but um, we're gonna look at it again from a different perspective. Uh, this is gonna be a heavy sermon, and um, it's gonna be a difficult sermon for most people that have had any kind of experience. I've divided the sermon into three parts. In the first part, we will look at types of evil or suffering. In the second part, we will look at the problem of evil. And in the third part, where I hope to spend almost half the sermon time, we will look at a worldview that gives us a reasonable answer. Many times when you come for a sermon, you expect to have some of your questions answered. But when I speak, I, I hope to raise more questions for you so that you leave with more questions than when you came in. And that's probably what's going to happen for this sermon. Some questions may get answered, but you may leave with more questions um, than when you came in. First, let's look at types of evil, types of suffering. Now, I'm going to use the phrase, the, the word evil and suffering interchangeably for the purposes of this sermon, but obviously we know that there is a difference. Evil is the cause, suffering is the effect, right? Evil is the cause, suffering is the effect. And, and it's a very loose categorization of, of the two different kinds I'm going to talk about. First is natural evil. Natural evil is in the natural world. So hurricanes, earthquakes, mudslides, sicknesses, diseases, all of that fall under natural evil. The second kind of evil is what is called as moral evil. And this is due to personal sin. And the two big examples are war and terrorism. And if you've lived in the last couple generations, I don't need to explain to you what war and terrorism is. We see that on a day-by-day on a, on a, on a -by -day basis. At the end of the day, whether it is moral evil or natural evil, it is traced back to the Garden of Eden, uh, Garden of Eden that started with moral evil. Let me, give you, let me give you an example to show you the difference between the two. 
Let's say that you're sitting uh, on your favorite couch with your laptop in front of you and you're pretending to work and right next to you is your uh, infant son. And your infant son can barely sit up but he's right there and he's enjoying his time with, with, with daddy. And so as you're working on your laptop, he flails and he knocks over the the cup of water that's sitting right there and it falls on your laptop and it destroys it. Is it natural evil or moral evil? It is natural evil. Suppose your young infant son grows up to become an older and smellier teenager. <laughs> when that happens and if you tell your teenager to do something and in, 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 uh, to spite you, your teenager or that teenager uh, pours a cup of water onto your laptop because he wants to spite you, that would be moral evil. You see the difference? In one, in moral evil, there is the exercise of the will. In natural evil, there is no will that is exercised. Second, let's look at the problem of evil. The problem of evil. It is a philosophical, theological phrase. How many of you have heard about the phrase, the problem of evil? Great, a few people have heard it, excellent. All right, the problem of evil is the idea that if there is an omnipotent, omnibenevolent God that exists, there cannot be evil that exists concurrently, okay? The problem of evil is the idea that if there is the existence of an all-powerful, all-good God, there cannot be the simultaneous existence of evil. And this problem is a very multi-layered problem and many people have left the Christian faith and become atheists because of this one problem. Because they look at evil and say there cannot be a God who is all powerful and all good because I see suffering. Jack Welch, who was CEO of General Electric, was a devout Christian, but after his mother died, he asked God why this happened, and he left the church and never returned. There are many people who find suffering to be a problem. There are many layers to this question, as I said, and there's so much material out there. What I'm going to say for the next 25 minutes is probably less than 1% of the material that is out there. Let me divide the problem of evil into two parts. The first part is the logical problem of evil, where we ask the logical question, why? There is a logical answer if you ask why is there evil, there is a logical answer for it. It is called a theodicy. And many sermons uh, revolve around this. Many sermons on suffering revolve around the question of why there is evil from a logical standpoint. So we've heard sermons where, uh, where the Bible says evil or suffering leads to perseverance and uh, character building, and it is good for us to have some suffering in life to uh, appreciate that which is good. And we see God's character through, through suffering. So all those are logical answers to the problem of evil. One of the things I do at work, I don't do much at work, but one of the things I do at work <laughs> is I do biopsies. So I have a patient sent to me by their primary practitioner, um, because they saw a lesion that they don't know whether is a normal variant or not. They come to my office, I take a look at it, I see if it, if it looks like a normal variant, there's nothing to do, you're welcome to go back, uh, welcome to go away. But if it looks slightly different, I, I biopsy it. If it's a small lesion, I cut the whole thing out. If it's a big lesion, I cut a small part of it out. And then I send it to the lab here at Johns Hopkins where they tell me in a week what the biopsy report is. And then a week later, the patient comes back and I sit with them and I tell them what the biopsy report is. 98% of the time, I have the joy of telling them, this is just a benign lesion, nothing to worry about. You don't even need to follow up and, and, and you'll be fine. But 2% of, of, of the time, that's not the case. I have to sit with them and have to tell them what they probably already suspected, that this lesion or this growth that I just biopsied is a malignant lesion. And I sit and explain what that means for the patient. 
and the family because now their life is about to change. And sometimes they ask me, why did this happen? And they are asking the logical question, why did this happen? And so I say, oh, it could be related to your smoking history, or it could be related to your alcohol use because they have a synergistic effect. Or if they said that they um, did not smoke and they ask further, why did this happen? I could explain to them about the nuts and stew hate hypothesis and so on. But they usually ask the logical question, why? But there is another question that remains, isn't there? And so the second kind of the problem of evil is the emotional problem of evil. When a patient goes away from my office, there is a why question that they have not asked me, but they go home and they ask the why question, why did this happen? For most people, the issue goes beyond the mind and it is a matter of the heart. For a person that has experienced evil and heartache, they don't most of the time care about the logical why. They want to know the emotional why. Why did this suffering happen to me? Maybe there's someone here who has experienced a, a, a terrible diagnosis, either personally or in your family. Maybe there's someone here who has suffered a loss of job or income from, from factors outside of your control. Maybe there's someone here or listening that has experienced the unexpected death of a loved one. The logical why does not matter. You don't care what the cells did for that cancer. You don't care. But you've asked the emotional question, why? Why did this happen? And as Christians, we go a step further. If God is all-powerful, and God is good, and I am his child, why did this suffering come to me? Gideon asked the same question in Judges chapter 6, verse 13. He said, pardon me, my Lord. Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And many times we can take it a step further and start blaming God for the suffering that has come upon us. Having raised this painful question, I want to turn to the major part of this sermon. Let's look at a reasonable answer. Which worldview gives us a reasonable answer? I'm not going to look at every religion. I'm not going to look at Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam. If there is anybody here who is, who is from those religions or listening now or later from those religions, you are welcome to see how your religion answers the question of the problem of evil. And what I present today is going to be the Christian worldview on the problem of evil. And you are welcome to compare to see what your religion talks about the problem of evil and suffering and what the Christian worldview says. But I want to look at two worldviews. I want to first look at the atheistic worldview on the problem of evil. The atheistic worldview uh, because the West is getting more and more secular, more and more atheistic. Our educational institutions are getting more secular and atheistic. Our media institutions, our entertainment institutions are all more and more secular and atheistic. And if you went to, from school, you went to college, you will find there's a big difference between school and college where it is completely secular, uh, secular in our colleges. And that's why I want to discuss the atheistic viewpoint. The religion of the contemporary public square is secular naturalistic atheism. The religion of the contemporary public square is secular, naturalistic atheism. Maybe there is somebody here or listening online now or later who has a atheistic worldview. You may not necessarily believe that there is no God, but God is not a part of your life. And you don't spend two thoughts a day thinking about God. So you may have just a, a, a secular atheistic um, viewpoint, even though you're not an avowed atheist. 
my first thing is to thank you for coming and thank you for tuning in, thank you for listening, and I hope that I'm able to accurately depict what is the atheistic viewpoint and what is the Christian worldview on this matter. The usual question that is asked from the atheistic viewpoint is, if there is God, why is there suffering? And this is the argument that is made. If God exists, evil and suffering cannot exist at the same time. Suffering exists, therefore God does not exist. Now, the Christian viewpoint that I will give later will answer that question, but I have some counter questions for this atheistic viewpoint. Let's assume that there is no God. Okay, and that the, um, the um, universe was created uncaused by an uncaused Big Bang, one of the seven uncaused th theories that they have on the Big Bang, and uh, you know, 13.6 billion years ago, and we all evolved from primordial soup. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Where did evil and suffering come from? From the atheistic viewpoint, we all came from primordial soup. Where did evil and suffering come from? In fact, where did morality come from? Where did the fact that something is right and something is wrong come from? If we came from single cells, or if we came from biochemical particles. In fact, where did the idea that evil is bad and good is good come from? You see, you, you've got to go beyond the mere fact of something being evil and good. You've got to go beyond that to recognize that evil is evil and good is good. Where did that come from? To the question, why is there evil from the atheistic standpoint, you know what answer they have? Nothing. There is no answer. The biologic basis of atheism is naturalism, and naturalism is Charles Darwin's theory of natural selection, where we came from a single cell, and over time, because of the survival of the fittest, we the, the fittest are now here. I know we may not think so, but we are the fittest that are here, and the, and the weak ones disappeared over time. For the fittest to survive, they must overcome the weak. So there is no place for compassion, no place for tenderness, no place for love for the weak. How would this play out over time? Charles Darwin himself said this in The Descent of Man when he wrote, at some future period, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace throughout the world the savage races. Charles Darwin himself predicted that the logical outcome of his theory of natural selection would be genocide. And that is exactly what happened 150 years later when Hitler came on the scene. In his book, Mein Kampf, Hitler's words reflect Darwinian language when he makes the case to exterminate the Jews. Ladies and gentlemen, the position of naturalistic atheism promotes evil and suffering. Let's turn to the Christian worldview. How does the Christian worldview answer the problem of evil? There are multiple parts to this. I'm going to mention only three. First, this is not the beginning. This is not the beginning. Human history did not start with evil and suffering. Instead, it started in a perfect garden with Adam and Eve. It was supposed to be good. It was supposed to be perfect. It was supposed to be sinless. But then sin entered the world. You see how the biblical account gives an origin for human evil and human suffering. So in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 29, it reads, God created man upright, but they have gone in search of many schemes. It's not God's fault. It's not God's fault. <laughs> Secondly, we are not alone. We are not alone. I want you to take a look at this video. It's a half minute video of a little infant. Meow. Meow. <laughs> okay, okay. Bye. <laughs> 
No, 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 no. It's a no, the bad. You don't do that, Daddy. I don't like it, Daddy. Make I don't like it. Why is it that we as grown adults find it funny, right? <laughs> that a kid is crying, right? <laughs> a kid is crying. I mean, the kid is going to grow up and know that cats are terrible. I mean, I get it. <laughs> but the kid is crying. And somehow we find it humorous and we smile and it's funny. I think the reason is because we know it's going to be okay. Whatever the kid is, is experiencing at that time, his emotions and our emotions don't really line up, but we know it's going to be okay. It's not, it's not the end of the world, even though the kid may think that. And, and many times when we see kids crying for frivolous, random reasons, we know it's going to be okay. I want to take you back to a very common, familiar verse that we all know about. In John chapter 11, verse 35, it says Jesus wept. And I'm going to set the context for it. Jesus, a friend of Jesus, Lazarus died. His two sisters, Martha and Mary, were, uh, were weeping. So he comes to the, the, this little town of Bethany where his friend had died. And it's been three days and uh, he was well and truly dead. And so he comes to the tomb. And if you read the narrative in John chapter 11, you understand that Jesus knew that he was going to die. And Jesus knew that he would raise Lazarus up. And But when he comes to the tomb, he sees his friends Martha and Mary cry. And then are these nine powerful letters which says, Jesus wept. He knew that it would be okay. And yet, Jesus wept. One of, the, one of the ways that Jesus answers the emotional problem of evil is through his presence. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, it reads, A virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. On March 14, 2022, newspapers across the world ran a particular story about the Russian war in Ukraine. A woman whose name we don't know went into a maternity hospital to give birth to her child. But when she was there, in spite of the ceasefire that was there, savage Russian forces bombed the maternity hospital. The woman suffered a, uh, a fractured pelvis and a dislocated hip. And she was taken out on a stretcher by four people to another place where doctors could help deliver her baby. And as the doctors were trying to deliver her baby, she recognized that she wanted her baby to live. And so she told the doctors to focus their attention not on her, but on the baby that was to be born. And so they focused the attention on the baby. And when the baby was born, it was stillborn. The baby had already died because of the bomb that just happened. And so after that, they spent 30 minutes in trying to resuscitate the mother. And she did not make it. Kevin D. Williamson, in the National Review, the next day writes these words. And I'm going to read to you two paragraphs of what he wrote. We are all Ukrainians now, says a heading cover over Wall Street Journal. The sentiment is a humane one, but it is a lie. We are not all Ukrainians. Most of us are far removed from anything like that kind of danger or that kind of suffering. The worst we have felt is higher gasoline prices and more expensive groceries, but it is not the same. It is not easy to be brave. It is not easy to suffer. But how much easier it must be to suffer oneself than to watch one's children suffer, to be cold and hungry, to die, blown to pieces in the womb, before taking their first breath. How many Ukrainian mothers and fathers would happily and joyfully give their own lives if they, it meant that their kids could enjoy a decent dinner and a safe, warm place to sleep? 
That is, if they could have what my dogs have. Millions, I assume. No, we are not all Ukrainians now. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot truly identify with suffering when we are far removed from suffering. And that is why the account of Jesus is incredible. There is no other religion in which God became a historical human. Jesus became exactly like one of us. In fact, he was so indistinguishable from the men around him that they needed someone to betray him. He took on humanity with its limitations and burdens, hunger, thirst, tiredness, and tears. If his birth was scandalous, his death was shameful. If his life was cruel, his death was excruciating. He was rejected, he was misunderstood, he was abandoned, he was despised. With his life and death, Jesus is the God who is present with us in our suffering. He became one of us to save us, but also to understand us, to feel our pain, and to weep with us, and to be Emmanuel, the God who is with us. This is not the beginning, and we are not alone. And thirdly, this is not the end. The suffering you are going through is not the end. What does the atheistic worldview have to offer in terms of the future? Death for atheism is an annihilation of the soul. And the way it's described is when you blow out a candle. What happens when you blow out a candle? That's the end. It's same for Buddhism as well, where they believe in annihilation of the soul. Once you're dead, that's the end of it. That would be okay if our lives were perfect, right? If we were born in a perfect world with no physical, no mental, no emotional, no psychological problems, with no suffering, no evil whatsoever, then sure, if there was annihilation of the soul and this was it, it's fine, it's okay. But look around us. It's anything but blissful. If, if life was the end of it, the atheistic view is a bleak view. It is a hopeless view. But the Christian faith has hope for the future because of the resurrection of Christ. And beyond the agony of the cross is the glory of the empty tomb. Beyond the defeat of Friday is the victory of Sunday. And before the suffering of Calvary is the hope of heaven. Evil and suffering are not the end. And in Revelation chapter 21, verse 3 to 6, it reads, And I heard the loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. For secular atheism, death is the ultimate end. For the Christian, God is the ultimate end. I'm going to give the opportunity for three groups of people to respond to the sermon. If there's anyone here who's never invited Jesus into your life, you can stand up and we will pray together. If there's anyone here who has been bitter toward God, you can also stand up and we will pray together. If there's anyone here who's going through unimaginable suffering, you can also stand up and we will pray together. If 
If there's anyone here who's never invited Jesus into your life, the gospel gives hope for the future, gives hope for today and hope for the future. It is the, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that gives us hope. You can pray something like this. If it's a prayer that comes from the bottom of your heart, God will answer it. You can pray something like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. And I cannot save myself. Thank you for your death in my place. Thank you for resurrection and the hope of eternal life. I ask you to come into my life and make me complete. Help me to live for you. Heavenly Father, I pray for those of us who have gone through suffering and we've questioned you. We've asked you why. It was our emotional why. And we've asked you why. And we've doubted you. And we've become angry at you. And we've become bitter toward you. Maybe some of us have even considered leaving the Christian faith. It's not your fault, Lord. I ask you to forgive us. And I pray that you would turn our suffering so that we cling closer to you. I pray for those who are going through unimaginable suffering at this time. We thank you that the Father allowed Jesus to go through unimaginable suffering for our sakes, for the salvation that he procured for us so that we could have a hope of eternal life. Give us the peace of your presence. Thank you that you are the God who is with us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You can please have a seat. Take a second, just take a deep breath. Whew. That was a good one. <laughs> Grace, um, we're going to enter into a time of communion. And what better time um, as what we just learned in this time that we spent together and the why. I'm one who understands the why. I've just recently gone through some really hard things and I've asked the same questions. And the one thing that I continue to hold strong to is that just like a new share, Jesus or God came and became fully human too. So there was a time that he experienced the emotion. He experienced everything that we experience. There's nothing that we're going through that he doesn't feel that emotion. He's in it with us. He is in the fire. And he took the first sacrifice. The first sacrifice on the cross and the night before he went to God and he said if I don't have to do this please take this cup but if it be your will father let it be done so as we have this time of communion let's reflect what are the whys that we're asking and in this time, let's bring it to the cross. The cross where our Lord and Savior came to save us. Our Lord and Savior came to make the ultimate sacrifice. And with in mind, you, your face, your name, he pictured as he entered into that space. So as our wonderful hosts come forward to um, pass out the elements my question for you is in this time that we're going to enter into the worship what is your why let's ask God sit in that and in the waiting in the waiting is where the Lord will build character will give us strength will give us peace if we ask for it it is in the waiting 
and I'm going to ask you to hold the elements through this time as we go into worship, and we will take them together. Let's worship together. Tales. I guess I've outgrown them, but that doesn't mean I don't believe that there's something bigger than me. Because I've seen it in a hospital room when the doctor said sorry. There's nothing more we can do. Well, it wasn't through. I've never seen a pot of gold end of a rainbow but I've got a promise I can hold in the middle of the struggle God if you said it you'll perform it may not be how I want you to but here's what I'll do I'm gonna wait on you I'm gonna wait on you I've tasted your good
night before Jesus went to the cross, he took the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. Take this in remembrance of me. So Grace, please take the body of Christ. And in the same manner, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood shed for you. Take this as a covenant and know that I love you. So Grace, take the blood of Christ. Jesus, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the sacrifice that you made. We thank you that you came down and you know our pain, God. You know our suffering. But you came here to be with us, to commune with us, to share with us, to cry with us. And we thank you for that. So we remember you and we thank you in this time. shall mount up up on wings like an eagle and soar they shall walk and not get weary they shall run and not faint that's what happens when you wait happens when you wait they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up on wings like an eagle and soar they shall walk and not get weary they shall run and not faint that's what happens when you wait happens when you wait that's what happens when you wait get a little stronger that's what happens when you wait That's what happens when you wait. 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 Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. That's right. That's what happens when you wait. You get a little stronger. Let us hold true to that. So when we face our wise, we're going to get a little stronger. What a wonderful day it is to be together. So our prayer partners are going to come forward. And whatever wise you have, they want to pray over that. They're an amazing group of prayer warriors. And they want to pray for you. So please, at the end of service, come down and let them Pray over whatever your why is. And before you leave, please receive this final blessing. May the Lord, our Savior, who came and sacrificed and felt suffering and pain, cover you and remind you of his goodness and his faithfulness and his love for you as you go forward. Grace, go in peace. Thank you so much again for joining us. If you felt moved or inspired by the worship or the word of God that was brought today and feel led to give, you can do so by giving online. Thank you so much for your continued support and generosity during this season. Thanks so much for coming again. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.